Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon um, for today's online conversation. My name is Carolyn, and uh, I imagine some of you uh, have, I've maybe introduced myself to some of you on the previous conversations we've run. And for those of you that uh, haven't met me yet, I work on the communications team at EcoJustice, and I'll be monitoring moderating today's conversation. Um, I have support today from my colleagues, Venetia and Caroline, who are working behind the scenes to keep things running. Uh, so I'm based in Vancouver, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I work and live on the unceded ancestral territories of the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. And about a half a block from EcoJustice's head office in Vancouver, uh, there's a totem pole, the survivor's totem pole. It stands in Pigeon Park. And it represents all the groups in the community that face systemic racial injustice and oppression, and is really a living symbol that the lives of indigenous and racialized people matter. Skundal, the Haida artist who led the design and carving of this totem pole, uh, once told me that she purposely left the bottom of it unfinished because the fight for justice is ongoing. And really, the fight for environmental justice cannot be separated from the fight for racial justice. Uh, last week, in the wake of the killing of George Floyd, our executive director, Devin Page, issued a statement on this, and in it outlined our organization's commitments to racial justice. Um, you can find that statement on our website in the press release section. So for those of you who are new to EcoJustice, uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about us. We are Canada's largest environmental law charity, and we operate offices in five cities, uh, in Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, Ottawa, and Halifax. And our mission is to use the courts and the full power of the law to defend nature, combat climate change, and fight for a healthy environment for all. And we started this conversation series a few weeks ago because we wanted to give you an inside look at what we're doing to make sure that, you know, when we get to the other side of the COVID pandemic, Canada doesn't just sort of return to normal, but we actually get the country to a place that is better than normal. And in just a few moments, Alan Andrews, EcoJustice's Climate Program Director, is going to hop online and he's going to talk with you about what the climate team has, team has been up to to make sure Canada gets on the path to a low carbon future. Uh, you're also going to hear from EcoJustice lawyer Julia Kroom and Alex Neufeld. And Alex is one of the seven young people suing the Ford government for its climate rollbacks. And then at the end, we've set aside time uh, for you to ask questions of today's panelists. But before we get into things, I want to quickly go over some housekeeping items to get you comfortable with the platform we're using. So on the right of your screen here, you will see an image of the control panel, and there's a few features that I'm just going to point out quickly. So starting with the grab tab, which is the orange arrow at the top left of your control panel, um, when you click on this, the panel is either going to expand or minimize. And with that panel expanded, you'll see you've got two audio options, computer or phone call. Um, you switch between the two by clicking on that circle beside your preferred audio option. And if you want to use your phone, this is where you can find instructions for calling in. And then the question box, um, this is where you can submit questions and comments at any point during today's conversation. Um, as you're hearing for the, from the speakers, I encourage you to uh, send us a question. If it arises, you know, just go ahead and send it right away. And actually, if you want to test that out now, um, why don't you go ahead and maybe share what part of the country you're joining us from? And just so you know, uh, only my communications colleagues and I can see your questions today. They can't be viewed uh, by other attendees. Um, and also, Venetia uh, is going to be responding to the questions. I see we've got folks from uh, 
Nanaimo, lots of people calling in from Toronto, uh, Ontario, other parts of Ontario, Hamilton, uh, hello Montreal, Winnipeg, uh, we got folks from Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands, so really people from across uh, across the country. Um, is anybody calling in from Atlantic Canada? Or outside of Canada? Oh, Athabasca, Alberta. Great. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to Alan Andrews, our climate director. Uh, Alan joined EcoJustice in 2018. He was born in Canada, but he grew up in the UK where he obtained a law degree from the University of Manchester. Uh, hello, Alan. And for eight years while in London, he led the clean earth team, at, the clean air team at Client Earth, which is an environmental law nonprofit that's similar to EcoJustice. And while there, he was advocating for better pollution laws in London and Brussels. And his work uh, in Europe led him to litigate in the UK Supreme Court and the European Court of Justice. So a warm welcome to you, Alan. I'm going to hand things over to you, and I'll see you all uh, at the question period. Thanks, Carolyn, and hi, everyone. Um, I'll start by saying how excited I am to be speaking to you all today. It's so rare that we get an opportunity like this to speak directly to, to so many of our supporters. Um, so thanks for, your, thanks for your time, and thanks for joining us. Um, I'll start with a, a bit of an introduction to the climate team. Uh, I'm Alan, I'm the climate program director. Uh, you can see me at the, the top of this slide uh, before my DIY COVID haircut. So hopefully you can still recognize me. Um, you'll also see that I'm fortunate to lead a team of quite brilliant lawyers really, who are based in offices across the country. Uh, I'm here in very rainy Vancouver. Um, but we have colleagues from out west in Victoria. That's Matt there with the uh, rather fetching bow tie who's based in Victoria, uh, all the way over to Danielle in Ottawa. Uh, and we're all working on groundbreaking climate litigation and envisioning the climate laws of the future. Uh, you'll be meeting one of them, Julia Kroom, shortly. Um, I should also give a special mention to our new director of law reform. That's uh, Tony Maas, who's over there in Ontario. He joined us last year and has really brought a new dimension to EcoJustice's law, law reform work, uh, which as I'll explain in the Canadian climate world is sorely needed. So when I arrived from the UK in January, 2018, I, I had this sort of naive assumption that Trudeau's Canada would be somewhat similar to Europe in its approach to environmental law. Uh, but I got a fairly early wake up call uh, as soon as I started immersing myself in Canadian law, I quickly realized that Canada's environmental laws are, oh well, and particularly its climate laws, I should say, are decades behind Europe's. So for that reason, a big focus for the climate change team is to push for stronger climate laws. And there we're looking to Europe, but also other Commonwealth countries such as the UK and New Zealand for inspiration. And we've had some early successes so far. Our work in the lead up to the federal election led to all the main progressive parties adopting commitments to introduce new climate law. Uh, the Liberals have, have followed up with that and we're still seeing a commitment to new climate laws, which Julia will talk more about shortly. Meanwhile, here in BC, we succeeded in securing a new climate accountability law last year. Um, that's a big step forward for the province. It, short, it falls short of some of the you know, best practice international laws that we see around the world, but it's it's nonetheless a, a big step forward and we're looking forward to making it, making it even better with our continued work. I should say that our investment in reforming laws doesn't detract from our focus on litigation. Uh, litigation is still our bread and butter. And in fact, the two approaches are really complementary. So for example, we're intervening in the Supreme Court of Canada in the carbon pricing reference cases in support of the federal government's jurisdiction to regulate greenhouse gases. That complements and is, is really buttressing our work pushing for a new federal climate law. Caroline, can I have the next slide, please? Oh, I should, before I move on, I should say, date for your diaries, September 22nd and 23rd, 
is the Supreme Court hearing in the carbon reference cases. You can follow online. Uh, we'll all be doing that from, from EcoJustice. Okay, the, the next slide is obviously uh, Paris, uh, and that's because we really take our mission from the 2015 Paris Agreement. Uh, that agreement aims to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees to avoid catastrophic climate change. A 2018 report showed that in order to achieve that objective, global emissions of greenhouse gases need to halve in the next decade in order to reach net zero by mid-century. Now, as a rich country with very high per capita and historic emissions, Canada must do considerably better than, than that global benchmark. Canada is also a major exporter of oil and gas, boasts the third highest hydrocarbon reserves in the world. So we also need to stop Canada exporting its greenhouse gas emissions through its fossil fuel exports. That was always a huge challenge. Uh, even before COVID. Uh, and as I'll explain, I think on balance, things have got even harder. Uh, Caroline, can I, we have the next slide? So the reason I say things have got harder um, might sound a bit strange because uh, like a lot of my friends have been saying to me, you know, surely your job has just got a load easier because no one's driving around, uh, no one's traveling, the skies are clean. And I've certainly taken comfort from some of the images I've seen in the media. Uh, you've probably seen them too. We've seen empty streets in, in LA. We've seen fish swimming in Venice's canals. Um, and I think my favorite is this one. Um, what you can see uh, next to that arrow is Mount Everest, just poking above the, the other mountains in the Himalayas. It's taken from Kathmandu. Um, and that's the first time they've seen Everest for decades because the, the pollution that normally shrouds the city has cleared because of COVID. But if we go on to the next slide, you'll see that the, the sobering reality is that every time we have an economic crisis, um, carbon emissions dip, but then they rebound fairly quickly. And this, this so far uh, is, is showing that it's not gonna be any exception to that rule. Um, we've had an unprecedented carbon crash because of COVID, but the projections are suggesting that even at the upper end, we'll probably only see a 7% reduction in emissions in 2020. And that's the kind of emission cuts we need to be making year on year in order to achieve the Paris Agreement objectives. And we need to be able to do that in a way that doesn't require life as we know it to grind to a halt as it has done in, in recent months. So, to excuse the pun, we still have a mountain to climb in order to make the, the deep structural, societal, technological changes that we need to achieve a carbon neutral Canada by mid-century. And so as we start to emerge from the COVID crisis, uh, we'll still be facing a climate emergency. That's not changed. So it's absolutely critical that eco-justice continues with its mission. Now, in some ways, we're already seeing a return to normal. The courts have adapted relatively quickly, and most of our cases are proceeding with only a delay of a few months. Uh, some of those hearings are taking place via video conference, which is great to see. Uh, others will, will actually take place in person, but obviously with some physical distance measures in place, like we're all used to seeing now in, in the shops. So that means we can at least continue with our vital litigation work. Um, but the reason I say things have got harder is mainly because governments are now under huge pressure to kickstart the economy at virtually any cost. We've already seen enormous pressure on governments to relax environmental regulations to encourage economic growth. Alberta and Ontario have already relaxed reporting requirements for industry. Alberta's challenging the new Federal Impact Assessment Act that EcoJustice fought for so long uh, to get in place. Ontario suspended public participation rights that are protected under the Environmental Bill of Rights. And even BC uh, has delayed the scheduled increase in its carbon tax. Fortunately, so far, the federal government seems to have resisted most of the siren calls from the fossil fuel industry. So it, it didn't grant the Canadian uh, petroleum 
Producers Association, its widely circulated wish list. Um, but it will continue to face immense pressure from the fossil fuel and extractive industries. And if we go to the next slide, please, Caroline, I think probably the worst example of that is coal, where we are seeing a big push by industry to resurrect Canada's coal mining industry. And this is despite Canada strutting its stuff on the international stage, boasting that it's powering past coal because it's going to phase out coal burning in Canada by 2030. Um, but unfortunately, that doesn't stop it from exporting coal to other countries where, of course, it will be burned, it will emit greenhouse gases, and that will contribute to climate change. So this um, resurrection of the coal industry is starting to happen. We've seen Alberta announce uh, its intention to scrap a 1976 coal policy. Um, this will make it easier to develop open pit coal mines in some of the province's most treasured ecologically sensitive areas. Uh, the company behind the Vista coal mine in Hinton, Alberta has applied to significantly expand the mine while publicly indicating that it intends to grow its production to 20 million tonnes a year. So we've written to the federal environment minister asking him to require an environmental assessment so that the impacts can be properly considered, but we need your help to make sure he gets that message. So if you haven't already, please join our online action and tell Minister Wilkinson to say no to unchecked coal production and order in an environmental assessment of the Vista coal mine. You should see a link to that page uh, coming through the chat shortly. So meanwhile, back to BC, um, similar story here in that Tech Resources has applied to expand its coal mining operations in the Elk Valley over in the Kootenays. And not only have those mines poisoned both Canadian and US waterways with toxic selenium pollution, they're also polluting the atmosphere with greenhouse gases. And that's something at every stage of the process. Okay, so you have greenhouse gases emitted when they're actually mining the coal. Um, then they have to transport it to markets, often in Asia. You're emitting greenhouse gases uh, through that process. And then finally, at the combustion phase, uh, that coal is ending up in uh, mainly in steel, mill, steel mills for metal production. And obviously you're getting greenhouse gas emissions and toxic air pollution when it's burned. So that coal that's starting on, out underneath the Rocky Mountains in the Elk Valley ends up adding to our global climate crisis as much as all of the emissions from all of British Columbia put together. So more than every car, truck, plane, building, farm, factory in the whole province. So EcoJustice is going to continue to fight these projects with whatever tools we have at our disposal because the way out of the current economic crisis is not by investing billions of dollars and mortgaging our children's future on rescuing the fuels and technologies that belong in the 19th century. The future is in renewables, it's in retrofitting buildings so they're more efficient, it's in retraining our workforce so that they can contribute to the green economy. But unfortunately, the, the legal tools we have at our disposal aren't fit for purpose. Uh, we have inadequate environmental laws that mean that most of these polluting projects are rarely even subject to an environmental assessment. Even when they are, we're often not permitted to raise climate arguments. So instead, we, we often rely on nature laws or, or human health laws, which are much stronger than climate, in order to halt these major fossil fuel infrastructure projects. So as you've, you've seen with our high profile pipeline litigation and then more recently with our challenge to offshore oil and gas drilling off the coast of Newfoundland and Labrador. So while we hold the line against regulatory rollbacks and these retrograde projects, we also need to think beyond business as usual when it comes to the laws that we need to tackle the climate crisis. Um, and I think this is where uh, eco-justice is, is kind of unique. There's plenty of organizations who are focused on the policy and the technological solutions to the climate crisis and, and the COVID response. Um, the unique space we occupy is that we're focusing on how we anchor the response in law, both through litigation and more directly by pushing for law reform, uh, because we've seen too many times climate action stall 
when political focus shifts due to economic crises, most recently in the, the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. We simply can't afford for history to repeat itself this far into a climate emergency. So what we need are laws which allow Canadian citizens to hold politicians to account for acting on climate, both through the political process uh, and if necessary, through the courts. Our ongoing work on federal and provincial climate laws are really the cornerstone of that strategy. Uh, these laws aim to give Canadian citizens the tools to hold politicians to account for meeting climate targets and ensuring the private sector is also planning for a net zero future and are really transparent about the risks to their bottom line from climate change. So at this point, I'm going to introduce you to Julia Kroom. She joined EcoJustice in 2016, a couple of years before me, uh, from Toronto firm We're Faults. She's a litigator, an adjunct professor at the University of Toronto, uh, a cocktail aficionado, a mum, uh, all-round superwoman. I should also say she is one of the reasons I joined EcoJustice, because she's one of the first people I spoke to when I arrived in Canada, and she really inspired me to make the move over here. Um, she's been leading our work on climate accountability laws and is going to take you through the, the deep dive on that work. So over to you, Julia. Thanks so much, Alan. Um, before I get started, I want to acknowledge I'm speaking to you from Toronto, the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg and Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. This territory is governed by the One Dish with One Spoon Treaty, which is a treaty that defines this land as a space we need to share and take care of for all. Before I get into explaining the meat of our proposal, uh, or I should say the tofu, given the crowd, I want to set the stage, the context in which we have brought this forward, in which we're pushing for climate accountability legislation. If I can get the next slide, Caroline. So we have a dismal track record in Canada of missing our GHG emissions reductions targets. Uh, the 2000 target, which was set in Rio in 1992, we missed by 20%. The 2012 target set in Kyoto, we missed by 25%. We are on track, sadly, this year to miss the Copenhagen target by a wide margin. And the 2030 Paris uh, NDC, uh, we are still not on track to meet, not by a long shot. So what we're currently doing does not work. Can I get the next slide? We also know, uh, and we can draw from, the experiences of many countries which are serious about tackling climate change who have passed similar legislation. Uh, this map shows just European countries. There are many others who've been passing climate accountability legislation to address their own shortfalls in addressing GHGs. Um, New Zealand passed legislation in 2019, Mexico, others. So if this were a world map, you would see many more countries passing similar legislation. And we're able to draw from their experiences and those laws for precedent that we can apply here in Canada. The next slide. Lastly, there's also opportunity. So we have the need, we have the precedent, um, and I know in particular the UK on the precedent, I didn't mention that, but that is probably, that's the first uh, law which was passed in 2008. So not only do we have it as a template, we have more than a decade of its operation to look at and see what worked and what didn't. Um, we also have the opportunity in that this current minority liberal government made a commitment to enact legislation that would at the very least set in law long-term targets and what they call five-year emissions milestones. I'll expand on that in a second. And three quarters of the opposition parties made similar or stronger commitments. So we had this right moment in Canadian politics to have something rigorous passed here. Let me get the next slide. Okay, so what does climate accountability law look like? What are we actually pushing for? You can break it out into these three main elements. First, we need the law to be specific, to set out very clearly what is it that we need to achieve, what is the task or the challenge uh, that we face. And we may need to make that as clear and as specific as possible. There's three main elements here. 
Uh, we need legally binding long-term targets. So that might say, for example, in the law, if I, were, if I was able to write the provision in question, it would say something along the lines of, the responsible minister shall ensure that Canada's GHG emissions are net zero by 2050. That's in some ways simple and uncontroversial. We have a clear commitment from the Liberal government that they'll do just that, but those alone are not enough. You imagine our current COVID crisis. If our politicians were standing at the podium and saying, we want zero cases of COVID in 2050, and then stepping down, we wouldn't find that very helpful or uh, persuasive or reassuring. We need something more imminent, near-term, and tangible. And this is where medium-term targets or carbon budgets come in. Carbon budgets are like household budgets. They break down how much in the way of GHG emissions we can spend into smaller usable pieces. So for example, we need to be able to say, Canada will not emit more than 3,000 megatons of GHGs between the years 2025 and 2029. And so it's, it's immediately clear, what is the goal? We cannot emit more than that total volume in that time span. The law would have to require that these five-year carbon budgets get set regularly and into the future. The last piece under this, what do we need to achieve? What are the tasks? Are a clear picture of what we need to do to adapt to climate change. We're already seeing those impacts, wildfires, droughts, pests, uh, and they will only be increasing as the impacts of climate change increase over time. So we also need the law to mandate regular reports every five years, setting out the risks that climate change is sending our way. The next key element is legislated system of planning and reporting, which will really form the meat of action. So the law would say, the government is required to table a plan on how we'll meet each carbon budget, let's say one year after setting that carbon budget. Similarly, the law will say you have to table a plan on how we will adapt to the impacts of climate change, say a year after each impact report. Then the law will specifically set timelines for reporting. Um, we suggest annually and that that be regular and public. Where we aren't on track, the law will require the government to go back and adjust its plans and write reports clearly stipulating why they're off track and what they're going to do to address it. The last key element in a climate accountability framework legislation is an arm's length expert committee. That committee would be made up of independent experts on climate change, clean tech, economics. We'd want to ensure that they represent a range of interests across the country and Indigenous perspectives at a minimum. And they'd be required to provide advice on the targets, on the carbon budgets, on the impact reports, also on the plans. And then they would be independent of government monitoring and reporting on progress. So we have that sober, independent, expert, arm's length second look at what's happening. They'll be issuing their own reports, which we can look at to really cross check what's happening. I get the next slide. Now, the picture that I've painted is pretty similar to international best practices and pretty closely modeled on the UK and New Zealand laws in particular. But Canada has some unique features. Um, we're massive, we're geographically and economically diverse, and politically, we have a federal system, which means that the power to act on climate change is divided between the federal and the provincial and territorial governments. Of course, the provinces and territories can and are acting, but what we're talking about is building a national accountability framework, which has clear lines of responsibility and answerability. So what that means is we need to be clearer about the goals of the provinces and the territories for a national accountability system to actually deliver on accountability, because they're so important. The provinces and the territories have so much power in, in achieving the goals. So we need to be clear about what they are supposed to be achieving. So how do we do that? Can I get the next slide? In our recommendation, we suggest that the national carbon budget, so the national five-year carbon budgets, get fairly and equitably shared between the provinces and territories. 
after extensive consultation with the provinces and territories, stakeholders, industry, and importantly, input from those arm's length independent experts. These subnational budgets would be informational for the provinces. They wouldn't be binding on the provinces themselves, but they could look to them when they're crafting their own policies and so on. And they could certainly elect to pass them into law for themselves. British Columbia has set its own target in law, um, and as has PEI, just to name a couple. They could even higher than the suggested subnational carbon budgets under the federal system. But fundamentally what they would do, these subnational carbon budgets, is they would provide a guide for the federal government. When it comes down to it, when we're achieving our national carbon budgets, we want to make sure that we're actually doing it fairly and equitably to all Canadians. This is a discussion that's happening in the background anyway, but our proposal would really bring that out into the light and make it a scientific and data-driven discussion. And then hopefully, once it's enshrined and clear, be used to hold everybody accountable down the road. If I get the next slide. Okay. So I described this to you as sort of three key elements, but in our reports, um, which have been published online, are very detailed. And in our work with the government, we break this, our, our main asks, into five pillars. So the one, the long-term targets enshrined in law. Two, the five-year carbon budgets, both national and subnational. Three, five-year impact reports. Four, the planning and reporting system. And five, the arm's length expert committee. These five pillars are what you'll see in our work going forward, which means that you'll be seeing them in your inboxes soon when we ask you to reach out to your local elected officials and push for climate accountability legislation. And on that note, back to you, Alan. Thanks for that, Julia. Um, so advocating for the Federal Climate Accountability Act will continue to be a central focus for the climate team. Um, but in addition, we're working with Tony Moss, our Director of Law Reform, on envisaging the, the next generation of climate laws. Uh, climate accountability legislation is definitely part of that, but I, I think it goes beyond. Um, so one obvious step forward for that is to really think about how you start to bring in the private sector into climate accountability conversations. Climate accountability acts we're talking about really hold governments to account. How do we ensure that companies are really planning for a net zero world and being transparent about those risks? So I think that's a really exciting area that eco-justice could be increasingly getting involved in, in the future. But in the meantime, uh, we're going to have to use the laws that we do have to hold politicians to account. Um, the climate accountability laws Julia talked about are really intended to shield the climate process as far as possible from politics. Um, and we've seen in the UK that that's, that's worked, but ultimately laws can be repealed when the political winds change. And we've seen that so many times in Canada's history. So we may need to look to the Canadian constitution in order to secure sustained and durable climate action for years and decades to come. And that's really the aim of our biggest climate lawsuit so far. In 2018, Doug Ford repealed Ontario's relatively strong climate targets and replaced them with a new single weaker target for 2030. And in doing so, he sent Ontario in completely the wrong direction, just as all the science is calling for everyone to step up with more ambitious emissions cuts. Our case argues that by weakening the 2030 climate target, Ontario will emit more carbon pollution, that will contribute to climate change, and that will lead to increased illness, both mental, mental and physical, uh, and even death, as floods, fires, extreme heat and weather ravage the province. This, we argue, violates the charter protected rights to life, liberty and security of the person, uh, both of current and future generations of Ontarians. And because climate change will disproportionately affect younger people, they'll be alive for longer and will be around when the 
the much more severe impacts start to bite. Uh, and so it infringes the rights to non-discrimination that are also protected by the, the Charter. So we're calling on the court to strike down the weakened target and order Ontario to adopt a new target that's in line with the best science. And this case is really part of a, a global wave of youth-led climate action that aims to use constitutional and human rights law to force governments to act on climate. We filed the case in November last year, uh, and on July the 15th of this year, we will be in court. Uh, I'm not sure whether we'll be in court physically or whether by video conference, but we'll be in court uh, fighting a motion brought by Ontario, which aims to strike out our case at an early stage. We think it's critical that this case proceeds to a full trial so that we can present the compelling expert evidence that we've been amassing over the last year. This case is, is an attempt to silence us, an attempt to delay the case and slow down the time it will take for us to, to get in front of the court and show that evidence. Our clients in this case, uh, as you can see from the slide, are these seven amazing young Ontarians. And I'm delighted that one of them, Alex Newfeld, is going to be with us today. Alex, um, can you join us on the screen so the audience can see you? Hi, can you Alex. see me? Hi. We can see you. We, we can hear you. Hi. Um, Perfect. So, so happy that you can be with us here today. Um, why don't you start us off by telling us a little bit more about yourself, who you are, where you're from, and why you're concerned about the climate emergency? Yeah, for sure. So my name is Alex Neufeld. As you said, I am a 24-year-old entrepreneur. Um, I'm joining you today from unceded Algonquin territory, otherwise known as Ottawa. And I am concerned about the climate crisis for a whole host of reasons, but one of them being because I'm a business owner. I own a dress rental business in Ottawa and the climate crisis um, really presents an uncertain and scary future for business owners. Um, in, since 2017, Ottawa has had some quite extreme flooding and we've also had tornadoes, uh, which aside from being terrifying, quite frankly, especially the tornadoes, uh, they also kind of, they inconvenienced my business. And I mean, at this point it was just an inconvenience. People returned dresses late because they were busy shop backing their basement or whatever that was flooded. But, um, you know, as uh, these kind of extreme weather events get more severe and increase in frequency due to climate change, this has the potential to really royally mess up a whole bunch of businesses, especially ones that rely on logistics and shipping and stuff like that. So it's a very uncertain future for creative people and business owners like myself. Yeah, thanks. I, I can't imagine how scary a tornado is. Um, here in Vancouver, we get pretty scared when we get anything less than zero degrees. Tell me, what has it been like so far being being part of this case? Is it, is it what you expected? Is it what you imagined? I didn't know what to expect. Um, that's kind of how I do a lot of things in life, including running my business. I'm just like, this sounds fun. So I just start doing it. But it has truly been such a wonderful experience. I'm so inspired by um, everybody at EcoJustice who I've encountered so far, as well as my fabulous fellow applicants. They are all so engaged in fighting for a better future. And it's really amazing to see and when we launched the case back in November and we all congregated in Toronto for that, it was so surreal in like the best way possible. It was a little bit nerve wracking too, but just really wonderful. And I came back to Ottawa feeling indestructible. I was like, yeah, we're going to change the world. No one can say anything to me. I'm in such a great mood. So yeah, it was, it's been fabulous. Yeah. And that, that's definitely been my experience as well. It's been absolutely in inspiring and Standing on stage with you all uh, in November was definitely a, a career highlight for me. Um, okay, here's a question for you. Imagine the scene, um, you come out of court, uh, Doug Ford is standing there. What do you say to him? Well, that would be quite surprising indeed to run into Doug Ford. Um, keep, it, keep it clean. Huh, okay, I'll try my best. Um, well, Doug Ford, he... He thinks in terms of, or at least my perception is that he thinks in terms of like wins and losses a lot. It's like, 
oh, Ontario is the best or whatever. Um, so, and he's also big on open for business supposedly. So I think I would say, I'd be like, listen, Doug, coronavirus has whooped our economy's butt. You don't really have a plan going forward. You know what other jurisdictions do? They have a plan. It involves transitioning the economy to green energy, retraining and reskilling the workforce so that we can put all of these great plans to transition the economy into place. We don't have that plan. We're going to lose out. Do you want to be a leader? I think we should be leaders here in Ontario. That's what I'd say to him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, I'm sure others have lots of questions they want to ask you, so I'll, I'll stop hogging the mic. Um, I think now's a good time for us to move, move to a, a Q&A. Um, so maybe if um, Carolyn and Julia join us back on this little virtual panel, and we'll start taking some of the questions that I know have come through on the chat. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Um, we've had a ton of questions coming in. Um, I'll see how many we can get to. Uh, I'm gonna maybe start with the one for you, Alan, that's uh, sort of looking in the COVID-19 context. Uh, people were wondering which economic sectors are producing the largest amount of emissions? Yeah, I mean, that one really varies province by province. Uh, obviously, I know, I know more about um, BC than, than other parts of the country, but the usual suspects are the ones you can imagine, uh, oil and gas, a uh, huge emitter. Um, the waste sector is, is another big one, um, but transport alongside oil and gas is probably the, probably the biggest sector. And that's interestingly the one that we have seen the biggest reductions in emissions as a result of COVID. People have been stuck at home, they can't travel for work, they can't move around. Hopefully there is an opportunity there. Maybe I was a bit gloomy in my comments earlier, but I think one of the big opportunities with COVID is we could actually lock in some of those transport emissions reductions. If we could make some of these temporary changes more long-term, and more systemic. But yeah, the, the big polluters, oil and gas, transport, and then agriculture and waste are the, are the, are the big emitters. But the reality is in order to get to net zero, we need to be cutting emissions across the board. There really is no room for any one sector to be a laggard. Um, um, this is a interesting question that sort of is looking at individual actions versus um, sort of these big structural changes. So uh, here's the question. I'm interested in GHG emissions in cities where 85% of Canadians live. And I believe that if citizens know their emissions footprints, they would be more agreeable to efforts cities make for ways of reducing emissions. Do you have any ideas on whether consumption-based emission calculations would in fact help citizens in reducing emissions and can there be a law? And who would most likely take that on? So sort of what's your thought on that kind of individual actions versus- It's, it, it's a really interesting, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting idea. I, I do like instinctively push back against this idea that it's all on the individual and it's all about individual behavior change. I mean, we've seen with COVID the limitations of what we can do as individuals. Most of us have been stuck at home doing absolutely nothing for the last few months. And yet we're still, as I explained in, in my presentation, not achieving the emissions reductions we really need. Um, so yeah, individual behavior change has to play a part but really, I think the most important behavioral change we need to do is go out and vote and vote for politicians who will make the bigger, deeper structural changes um, to our power sector, to our industrial model in order to get those deeper changes that we need. Um, that all said, I, I think it's really interesting to look at ideas around how we can make people um, more mindful of their impact and for that reason, more amenable to some of these bigger changes that we know need to happen further down the line. So that's that's a really interesting idea, and I'd, I'd love to hear hear more about it. Okay. I'm going to um, take you out of the hot seat for a minute there, Alan, and maybe 
pose a question to you, Julia. Um, with provinces like Ontario and Alberta and Saskatchewan, you know, challenging the federal uh, price on carbon pollution, is there a way um, for carbon accountability um, law to, or this new proposed legislation um, to address that so that this couldn't happen? Um, well, you know, the fact of the matter is the provinces could still could challenge um, the climate accountability law that we're putting forward. But what we propose and what we would hope the provinces would see is that what the climate accountability legislation represents is a true exercise in cooperative federalism. Um, everyone pitching in together. Um, this is common work. GHG emissions um, are the, is the work of, of all levels of government and um, it's a heavy lift. It's a big lift to get where we need to be to meet that 1.5 degree warming. Um, and some of what climate accountability legislation offers is a more yeah, cohesive approach. Um, there's a lot of um, outreach to the provinces and territories, both by the experts themselves and through the other components of the legislation. So again, you know, hopeful that we get back into the spirit of uh, 2016 when pretty much all the first ministers signed on to the pan-Canadian framework. Um, we want to see that ethos but then taking it a step further and enshrining it in law so that it can you know more easily weather the uh, changes in political winds. Hi, thanks Julia. Um, maybe turning to our climate uh, litigation, the Ontario case, and apologies here, I have uh, somebody mowing the lawn next door, so I don't know how much this is impacting my audio, but uh, this person's maybe going to be here for a couple seconds. Uh, so we've had a couple questions around our clients and um, how were the youth clients selected and um, how come it was just seven youth and can more young people get involved? Yeah, why don't I take that and then hand over to, to Alex for the, the first person perspective. Um, in some ways, this client group kind of selected themselves really. Um, we had this idea for this case in Ontario. Um, we knew we needed um, some young people who cared about climate change and all our seven clients were already very committed climate activists, campaigners, doing the work in their own lives. So this this case for them, I think, was really in the next step um, in that journey. And a lot of it was done through word of mouth. We, we spoke to our first, um, first plaintiff, um, Sophia, and through that, it just kind of caught fire. And then soon, all of a sudden, we had, we had seven plaintiffs. Um, and we're pretty happy with the client group we've, we've got at the moment. Um, but one thing I can say is Eco Justice is committed to more big, exciting constitutional climate cases. And there will be other opportunities for young people to get involved in those. We're always looking for good clients. So maybe I'll, I'll hand over to Alex there and hear her perspective. Sure, thanks. Um, so yeah, how I got involved, I mean, I've been involved in climate activism for a few years now in my own community. Um, I, you know, whether just going to protests or whatever and meeting people that way, or um, I've also been involved with Citizens Climate Lobby, which is an organization that lobbies um, elected officials to try and get them to um, put in place carbon pricing legislation or improve that um, those mechanisms since we already do have a carbon price in Canada. Um, so yeah, anyway, I found out through word of mouth, like Alan said, from somebody who was like, hey, this sounds interesting. Do you want me to give this Danielle person your email? And I was like, yeah, sure. And then I guess Danielle or somebody else emailed me and then, yeah, I was hooked. I heard, I got on the phone with a couple people and I was like, this sounds like, like Alan said, a logical next step. And I think as um, a business owner, that also gives me a different perspective from the other clients. So um, that's an interesting asset to have, I guess, among the applicants. And yeah, it's been a really fabulous journey. I'm so glad I got involved. Thanks. I think we have a, a time for a couple more questions here. Um, 
Alan, maybe I'll put this one to you. Uh, this comes from someone in Ontario who says, I work with the Mattawa First Nation in Northern Ontario and our focus includes climate change. Are you connecting with any indigenous climate initiatives such as the First Nations Climate Initiative in BC or others? And if so, what are your thoughts on how, about how we can work with indigenous groups on climate policy and legislation? That's a, a really good question, and I mean the simple answer is is yes, we are working with with indigenous groups. Um, indigenous climate action is is one group that we've we've worked closely with, and they, they were at our team retreat back in uh, 2018. Um, we have various um, cases running where we have indigenous clients. What we're in the process of doing as part of our net strategic plan. Is, is thinking about how we form more, more sort of long-term lasting strategic partnerships with indigenous groups um, where we have such clear alignment in terms of our objectives uh, and as part of our duty towards reconciliation. Um, and that could include climate cases that, that actually engage section 35 rights. It could be cases um, where we see First Nation communities who are disproportionately impacted by the effects of climate change, and that, and that could obviously be those northern indigenous communi communities who are seeing warming at twice the rate of the, the rest of the world. Thanks. Great. So maybe one last question for both uh, Alan and uh, Julia, maybe if you want to weigh on this one as well. Um, so a few people were talking about, you know, are asking like, what can what can I do as a Canadian citizen? And there was even some people expressing a bit of frustration where they feel like they're doing a lot in terms of getting out there, uh, striking and writing emails to politicians. Um, so what is sort of one of the most effective actions that someone can take that would have a the best impact on impacting both policy and legislation? Well, I think, uh, as, as I've already said, I think the, the biggest thing we can all do is, is get out there and vote on climate. But um, I'm sure all the people uh, on this webinar uh, do that already. Um, all those actions that, that you've mentioned are, are really, really important. Um, and maybe just to add to that, one thing I've experienced over the last couple of weeks in response um, to the Black Lives Matters protests is the value of having conversations with people, especially conversations with people who don't necessarily see the world in the way you do. So I've had some really tough, awkward, at times heated conversations in the last few weeks with people on, on the issue of racial discrimination. I think the same holds true for climate. Um, it's you know, preaching to the choir isn't going to get us where we need to get to. It's persuading that that sort of middle chunk of people who are kind of supportive, but maybe a bit worried about climate change and whether all these measures are going to hit them too hard in the pocket, whether it's going to kill the economy. Maybe they've heard some uncertainties around the science and aren't sure how how solid it is. So I think those conversations are, are really important. And that's something I'm going to try and do do more of in the, in the coming years. Yeah, I, I totally second that. Um, try to amplify your, uh, your voice by even just one person who wouldn't otherwise be speaking up on this issue. If you can convince one more person um, to write to their MP uh, in support of climate accountability legislation, you know, you've doubled your impact right there. If you can convince 10 people that's phenomenal and you know challenge each of them to go out and, and do more themselves uh hard to do and at times awkward like we uh, i know that i can even this is my full-time job but there's any number of my friends that i don't prevail on um to do this work and i've started in the last couple of years to do that more frequently i will periodically send an email saying okay this election is going to be incredibly important and i want you to take a look at your writing and i want you to be part and i'll set it out in a lot of detail i'll do work and I'll write something uh, to friends and family and make my pitch. Uh, because coming from you, somebody that they know, it resonates more than coming from, you know, ex-environmental lawyer kind of washes over them. So, so take perhaps some of the tools that you get from us regularly 
um, put your own spin on it and, and amplify it out into the world and ask them to be taking those actions to voting, writing letters. Great. Thanks, Julia. Um, I think that's probably all the time we have for questions, although I just want, because there were a few people that were asking things around uh, volunteering, and yes, EcoJustice does work with volunteers. Um, there are, I think, even some environmental lawyers out there who were asking and some law students, so you can go to our website and see. That's where we post uh, volunteer opportunities there. Um, we definitely uh, welcome and encourage people to get involved. Uh, there was also people asking about how they can spread the word about our Ontario uh, climate case. And if you again, you go to our website and go to the Action Centre, uh, we have an action up there right now that's a, a hand raiser to stand with the Alex and the other uh, young people who are involved in this lawsuit. So you please uh, share that uh, on social media and with your networks. Um, and there was another question that was around um, the right to a healthy environment. And I just wanted to direct people, uh, if you're interested in uh, learning some more about work we're doing around that, Dr. Elaine McDonald uh, did a conversation earlier or last month that is recorded and up on our website right now and uh, she talks about the work that we're doing around securing the right to a healthy environment uh, in federal law so um, head over there for some more information and I just want to thank everyone for joining us and I'm going to actually hand it over to you Alan I think you have some uh, cro closing remarks and uh, it was great to uh, that so many people could join us today. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Carolyn, and, and thanks to, to all of you for joining. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have. Uh, this was unfortunately our last in this series of conversations on how we're going to make sure Canada is better than normal post COVID-19. We hope that you feel a, some sort of comfort in knowing that even during these uncertain times, the eco-justice team is as committed as ever to using the power of the law to fight for a safer climate future for all of us. As one of the only charities in Canada that does public interest environmental litigation, we have the knowledge and the experience to speak to lawmakers with credibility about what needs to change to make sure we have strong enforceable climate laws. We couldn't do this work without the generosity of our donors, people like you, to deliver on our mission. Um, you've heard today that there's still much work to be done and we can't stop now. This is how we ensure a safer, healthier future for present and future generations of Canadians on the other side of the pandemic. So I appreciate that these are financially difficult times for, for lots of us. Um, so if it is within your ability to do so, please consider making a gift to EcoJustice today. We've added a link in the chat uh, or you can visit us at www.ecojustice.ca to donate in support of our work. Uh, thanks to you, we're going to keep doing what we've always done. Let's use the power of law to defend nature, combat the climate emergency, and protect the health of Canadians. Um, finally, some housekeeping. If you missed part of today's talk or you'd like to share it with a friend, you'll be emailed with a video link in the next couple of days. Uh, you'll also be able to find a recorded version on our website later this week. So thanks for joining us and thanks for all your continued support. Bye.